Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Hi friends and welcome to the Encounter program. I'm Reverend Rachel Helgeson. Today I have a special treat for you. Um, I'm not going to give their names quite yet because I'd like for you to listen if you're on the radio or if you're watching with us on WVNG, this little video clip of our musicians, and then you'll get to hear who they are. So um, I'm really excited to share this with you. Um, and as you know, I hail from Northminster Presbyterian Church and well, New York, I'm the pastor there and um, I have fixed the situation in my space so it doesn't look like a dungeon like last time you saw me, so that's a little bit better. Um, but we're thanks be to God for you and thanks be to God for this opportunity to be able to hear and to share and to listen. So um, I would like to share this with you. Let me get this up for you. Here we go. So I have to pull it up and... <laughs> So friends, um, I'm excited to introduce you to David Root, who is a trombonist, and Mika Kimura, who is a pianist. Um, they both have wonderful careers working in the classical world, um, across from Japan to the UK um, to the United States. They currently reside in Kentucky. So this is one of those opportunities where we're able from the Southern tier to be able to connect with folks who don't live quite here, but have similar experiences to those of you who are musicians and artists um, and fully understand what that has, struggle has been in this time of difference. Um, I don't like to say new normal because it doesn't feel normal. Um, and yet here we are. So, um, And one special other thing is that uh, Mika and Dave are my brother and sister-in-law. And so um, I feel I'm also really excited that I can speak to them and share their gifts with you um, as you got to hear a little bit from them. Um, what a wonderful thing and what a gift from both of them. Um, so welcome, Dave and Mika. I'm glad you're here with us. Um, I'm glad that you are virtually here in the Southern Tier. <laughs> um, so first off, I'd like to just start off and if you could talk a little bit about um, how did you get drawn to the instruments that you play on and and what sort of led you to that space um, to now? Uh, yeah, I um, I picked the trombone. I started playing trombone when I was in the fifth grade, and uh, we had um, kind of remember it uh, really clearly. Actually, we went to um, uh, they had a bunch of instruments at the high school uh, in in Franklin, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, and uh, I was going to play the trumpet. I was kind of set on that, <laughs> and. Uh, but the, all the other kids wanted to play the trumpet, so the line to the trumpet, you know, to try the trumpet was really, really long, and nobody wanted to play the trombone, and the line to the trumpet was the trombone was really short. So I kind of kept going back and trying the trombone, and after a while, I kind of liked the slide or that kind of thing. So I, I ended up picking that. Um, I I played kind of seriously in in high school, but never had any aspirations of going into a career. For it, and then I, I went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania for um, uh, with the intent of being a, a criminology major. Okay. I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say that and people laugh. <laughs> like I actually wanted to be in the FBI. That was my plan. <laughs> really, yeah, it's, yeah, I know. And then I, but I started have, was having trombone lessons, and initially the the trombone professor there was like. Uh, 
really busy, he was a really sought after teacher. And so I had to really practice to like stay in his studio. And after about a month or so, I kind of noticed I was getting really good really fast. Uh, partially from the practice, partially because I had like a really serious teacher, you know? And uh, so then I got to the point where I practiced more and more because I just wanted to get better. And then mm -hmm. I started skipping my criminology classes to go practice a <laughs> trombone. <laughs> and about halfway through the semester, uh, his name's Christian Dickinson. He, he was like, Dave, you know, you should be like a ma music major. So I went into that. I, I Then I started taking orchestral auditions. And then, yeah, that's how I became a musician. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. I didn't. I for, had forgotten about the criminology piece because yeah. I always think about you being like a music major, and then you went in Western Pennsylvania, and then going to Duquesne, and yeah. then uh, finding your own path afterwards, working professionally. And um, um, and I'll. I don't want to spoil the surprise about how you and Mika met, but I'll let Mika speak a little bit, and because I know that there's an intersection that comes up a, a little bit. <laughs> So I started learning piano when I was three years old because my mother is a singer and she had her own piano studio and you know she, she taught so she was my first teacher and my sibling, all sibling, my older brother and younger sister, all of three, we started the piano but I was the only good one. <laughs> <laughs> They're not here to hear this right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Speak really here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the beginning, and then I, 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 I was quite serious from younger age, and um, and then I went to England to study. Mm -hmm. That's how we met. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you both studied at the. Royal, the Royal Academy of Music. Yeah. Royal Academy of Music. For those of y'all who maybe not in the music world, the Royal Academy of Music is um, the British version of Juilliard. So um, that just sort of gives you a framework to understand the high quality and level that Mika and Dave have been at and, and are continue to be at, which is, um, but also sort of a magical thing that an American met um, a Japanese woman in England um, <laughs> at music school. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Not even in the same musical setting either. I mean, because at that sort of school, the pianists are in the piano section and the brass players are over in the brass section. So um, what a gift that they're able to find each other and almost seems like right out of a romance novel, honestly. So congratulations to the two of you on that. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, so you both were in England and you were playing and you, you had graduated and um, I know Mika, you continued on with some studies at one of the other, mm -hmm. other schools. Am I remembering that correctly? Right. Yep. And then um, you both were teaching and playing and gigging around. And so, so now you're in the United States. Can you speak a little bit to how, how, I mean, I know that Dave, you grew up in Western Pennsylvania, so this is not as much of a stretch, but um, you had to decide, right, whether you're, you're going to go to Japan, whether you're going to stay in the UK, or whether you're going to come to the United States, which is not a normal decision everyone has to make for themselves. Where are we going to live? Oh, we'll just live down the street or in a state over. But you all had to pick through between three different countries to decide where you were going to land. So how, how did that process come about? Yeah, it was, uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> it's a tough one to answer. Yeah, was, to choose the country was quite logical because if we move to Japan, he doesn't really speak Japanese. So, like, he, I don't know, he has to learn the language before he gets a job, everything. And since I only graduated high school in Japan, I don't know, I don't have, like, much connection. So for us, it's not really making any sense to move to Japan and the culture is very different for him, especially in the movie to US, it's a bit easier in a way. Mm -hmm. Where he's from, uh, they speak still English, different from British English, but you know, mm -hmm. they speak sort of same yeah. uh, language. Right. So um, that was a decision. Yeah. But then choosing states where we go, that's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. I have a feeling that it would be a lot easier for a for me to find work here than for me in Japan because I'm a foreigner and I yeah it's like uh, yeah that was that was a real part of the the decision and London is great I mean I love the city it's it's a fantastic mm -hmm. city um, 
as you said, you know, we had to do like a lot of teaching. Like the cost of living is kind of astronomical. So uh, that was kind of part of the factor as well because there were some periods where I was teaching more lessons than I even knew what to do. And it was, I remember one day, it was right on the last year I was there, I think on my Wednesdays, I had to wake up at like 5.30 or something and catch a train at 6.15 and then walk 40 minutes to the near to the school where I taught and I taught from 8 till 12 in this little like kind of like break room <laughs> where the students yeah. would come in there it was a really small space and then I had 45 minutes or an hour to get uh, to the other school and I only it was a 45 minute train ride so I had to eat my lunch on the train and then I teach like 1 until 4 and then I'd go home and then I'd like try to practice and my brain would just be like fried. And so right. um, we, we were like in the USA, we looked at, uh, we were initially thinking of going to Chicago. Oh, New York. In New, New York, York yeah. City. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. New York, the, the problem with New York is it's kind of really expensive too, like, mm -hmm. like London. Okay. So we kind of felt like we'd be sort of in the same situation, situation yeah. where it's like Chicago is a bit more affordable. But and it and it's also kind of central, and there's a lot of direct flights to Japan. But then, I, I we kept sort of moving further into the Midwest. We considered Indianapolis for a little while, mm -hmm. and then somehow settled on um, on Cincinnati area. And then um, uh, when we came back, we did a, I, I did two weeks of work with the Charleston Symphony in South Carolina, and then that kind of snowballed into like about two or three years of like ongoing like sort of like guest principal work there. Um, but we, uh, we, 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 I had sold a, a musical instrument in London and I had about $2,000 that I used to buy a junked up car that would just get us <laughs> to Toledo. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we drove this car to Toledo to stay with, uh, um, our other, my other brother, you know, John. Right. And then we drove down to Cincinnati to look at places. And in the second trip, the car died. <laughs> So we literally. When we are trying to march on the highway, where you need to speed up, we are getting slower and slower and slower. That was very scary. The alternator died. That's what happened. Like I kind of knew it was happening. I was like, suddenly all the lights went out. I was like, oh no, that's an alternator. And so we had to walk into a car dealership and try to negotiate, which is I don't recommend that. But we. Thought... <laughs> Our car just died on the side of the road. We're gonna yeah. try to buy a car like, now. Oh, thanks. The car's over up there, you know. <laughs> Try to like hide the fact that we don't have a working car, you know. Right. <laughs> but we we found this little house in uh, northern Kentucky. It's like uh, it. A five minutes to downtown Cincinnati. Yeah, and yeah. it's uh, it's really cute. It's a, it was built, I think, in the twenties. It's one of the old catalog houses. Oh, okay. You used to be able to buy a house in a catalog. You would write to Sears and say, "I like this house for like I don't know two thousand dollars or something," <laughs> and then. Um, they would send you the parts and then you would build it yourself. So, um, but yeah, we've been here for a few years now. Mm -hmm. It's great. And folk, folks would understand the similarity with that in the Binghamton region because um, they used to have the shoe factory here and people actually moved out of New York City up towards Binghamton because a lot of immigrants would come in this direction. Um, and with the shoe factory, there were houses that were just built very quickly. So the house that I actually live in is one, it's called a CJ house. Um, and so they were built to, for people to be able to have work. And some people would get off the boat at Staten Island in New York City, and they would have family members that were up in this region, and they would just say, where are you going? CJ, work for CJ. That's maybe the only English that they knew. <laughs> and um, they would help get them to come up. Um, and so folks would actually, in the Southern Tier, also understand what you're saying about New York City versus um, other regions of the country. That's there's a number of folks who live actually in the southern tier who um, have moved out of New York City or Philadelphia because of cost of living and being able to have a quality of life. So um, I know that a lot of our listeners would understand what you're saying, um, particularly right now as we're, we're seeing um, an uptick of folks who are moving out of New York City and Philadelphia to more um, rural or um, spread out. We're not really exactly rural, but we're not we're not New York City or Philadelphia either. So um, so what you're saying would resonate, I think resonates with a lot of folks would be hearing this right now. So it's hard when you have to make those sorts of decisions, but when you have to be able to think about the cost of living, what you're gonna be able to do, 
what you're trying to accomplish. And it makes sense why you would want to move near Cincinnati as far as being close to a conservatory, but also close enough to be near a major airport so you can fly in and out. So, um, and, and the silver lining yeah. also is like, I feel like we have a lot more time and space to practice now. So um, I can really, I mean, I, I have a little bit of teaching, but not a whole lot. Uh, and I think you have like what, one student, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I actually have time to focus on playing the trombone. That was the problem in London. I started to feel more like a teacher than an actual performer. And nothing against teachers. I think teaching is like probably the most important job in the entire music industry. It's way more important than what we do as far as I'm concerned. But it's not really my passion. So and I really wanted to spend my time performing really. So also uh, housing is very different. If you yeah. live in New York City or big city, you need to live like small apartment where we are in London, like small. So like your neighbor is like literally next to you. Mm -hmm. And yep. you cannot really practice, but here, fortunately, we have like a small house, and we have a distance from neighbors, so we can practice anytime, yep. which, which we need. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes a difference. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know, um, I, I experienced this before becoming a pastor. <laughs> so my my spouse, who's a percussionist, uh, when we lived in Dallas, Texas, we had a neighbor who was very upset with us for practicing in the middle of the day because we were in a rental and. Um, and we actually had to get a sound thing to make sure that we weren't over the sound. And she kept sending the sending people over to scold us about this. And it turned out we were right within the time frame we were allowed to practice and not over the sound thing. But eventually, um, they stopped taking her phone calls because she wasn't being accurate and representing what was happening. And this is the funny part of it was um, when they the police came over the one time asked saying they heard hard, loud music. They asked what I was practicing and I was practicing the hallelujah um, from Messiah for Christmas and it's Dallas, Texas, which is in the Bible Belt. So that pretty much shut that all down. Um, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and it was for a church program. So it, they said, this is not what we heard that you were doing so <laughs> um, <laughs> um but it's but it's a reality when you live in a more urban area that you know people are more sensitive to sound because just sound is going on all around you and it's it's surprising how much of a luxury um it is to have space to be able to practice and not have to worry and be gracious to your neighbors in the same breath so um so for those of you who have not experienced that um God bless you. Um, for those of you that have, also God bless you because it's it's an experience. So, um, which I think we're at a point where I'd like to just reintroduce who our folks are today. Um, this is Mika Kimura and David Rude. David is a trombonist and Mika is a pianist. Um, they have been working across the globe, really, I would say. Um, Mika has regular gigs that usually happen in Japan, and um, they both have had gigs in the UK and, and currently in the United States, and that has always been sort of a flush, um, which sort of transitions to my next part, which is, um, so we talked about how you all met, how you came to music, what led you to the instruments that you're at, how you decided where you're going to currently live, um, but this year has been so different, right? Um, and so I know that for both of you that you are international musicians, which even for national musicians, um, for folks who don't understand that context, a lot of musicians choose a place to live in the United States so they can go and travel and be able to pick up gigs. But for your case, it's even more so than just go living someplace and then taking gigs around the United States. It's taking gigs internationally um, that have been planned for a long period of time. Um, so how has, how has this time frame shaped that for you and what, what's changed and what, um, what has been silver linings and what's been hard? Um, I know it's a huge question, but, um, I think for some folks, this is probably a new territory to hear about because you don't always get to hear these sides, hear this side of the story of what's going on in the music, in the musical world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the arts industry shut down basically because we need audiences to perform. So um, that's kind of, I mean, I had work set up in the UK back in July that was that was canceled 
you are using. I had it in June in Japan, but then it's been cancelled because yeah. I cannot even travel this time. Yeah, you've got like a 14 day quarantine if you go back. Yes, if I fly. Same in the UK. I could go to the UK, but I have to be in like in a hotel for 14 days if before I can go out and do anything. So、um, basically, like, and I think this is.、Uh, Now some orchestras in Europe and in Asia are coming back online, but it's still pretty much shut down here.、Um, before that, I mean,、uh, like this last season, the 2019-2020 season was actually, at least for you know, it was, was kind of cooking along. I was doing、um, kind of a one-year position with the Columbus Symphony. It wasn't a formal one-year position, but I was basically playing all the season on, on second trombone, and I have. Uh, three uh, kind of smaller regional orchestra positions as well around you know, Columbus. Columbus Orchestra is in Columbus, Ohio, just right. Yep. Yes, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. And、um, and then it just in in one day just <laughs> stopped, <laughs> and and the governor said no more mass gatherings. It's 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 shut down. And I remember thinking like, oh, you know, a couple weeks could、mm-hmm. be okay. Yeah. Maybe by April we'll be back up again, and then. As it just kind of ticked on, you started to kind of come to the realization that like、uh, it's going to be a while, <laughs> you、okay. know. So、uh, that was hard. I mean,、uh, a lot of musicians were like. Also, all the gigs we line up, we work for it, we practice yeah, yeah. so much, and you know we're getting ready for it. But at the same time, exciting things because you know you practice, you put all the work into it, and then finally you are able to perform. But then that opportunity is kind of. Yeah. Cancelled or the postponed, so that was sad part、yeah. of that. We had a recital together in Iowa. We were supposed to go on tour together, but then、yeah. obviously it didn't happen. And,、yeah. So, I mean, that was that was rough. And I think like musicians everywhere are, like really struggling. I actually, I actually ended up on a、uh, getting interviewed by NPR for like All Things Considered and Planet Money, and because I was one of like the. You know,、uh, when all the unemployment figures came out, it was kind of staggering, and and uh, uh, I was, you know, asking a musician like, "What's it like? What are you doing?" And we're like, "Well, I can't work," <laughs> you know.、Okay. So yeah, a lot of orchestras went online and started doing. There was a whole sur- res- like huge outburst of all this like,、uh, like, you know, brass quintets putting videos together in their living rooms, you know, and and orchestras. Um, I think that there's one orchestra in the UK I actually、uh, worked with that、uh, made a、uh, the first scene of the third act of Die Valkyr. They, they actually did all of that. Oh wow! <laughs> Which was a major project, you know. But、um, so there's a lot of those now. It's um, um, I mean, I, I have been working actually. The, I, gigs have come in. I've been doing like. Uh, kind of small brass quintet stuff. It's all outdoor things: brass quintet, brass trios, pop-up concerts in the park, like outdoor art galleries where patrons will walk around and and have like a woodwind quintet or string ensemble here and spread out. Never more than like five or six people in one place, you know. But um, um, all the orchestras I work for, uh, I mean, I think they're starting to schedule some stuff into the fall. Usually it's kind of strings and percussion first because they can wear face masks.、Mm-hmm. On stage. Winds and brass. There's、right. a bit of.、Um, it's a little bit uncertain what the aerosol、mm-hmm. spread is、uh, from from brass instruments and from woodwinds.、Um, I know there there was a new、um, University of Colorado Boulder had come out recently with a、um, study on that particularly.、Um, so for, at least from the church world, I I know in my own congregation we haven't been singing, which is. So strange.、Um, we've been recording the music for singing.、Um, we have had organ, and we've had marimba, and we've had piano.、Um, but as, and we've been playing recordings of people、um, doing brass or doing woodwind instruments or singing. But we haven't had anybody physically in our space who's been singing, which has been、um, A、strange thing to do because my background is in voice, so、um, so I can understand the grief that's coming along with how do you perform.、Um, I know in in the Binghamton region, what you were saying about the pop up、uh, musicians, the Binghamton Symphony、um, has been doing pop up、um, shows to keep music alive in the city,、um, and so. 
people have had to be much more creative about how they can keep music going. Um, but I also know um, it's interesting at one of my worship services, the somebody had come back um, because we've been trying, we've been open, but it's been with a lot of restrictions. Um, and they got to hear somebody play the piano. Um, and the comment to me was, this is the first time I've heard live music in four months. And I forgot what that feels like, and it really does stir my soul. Um, so if this is any encouragement, <laughs> um, is that I don't think that live music is going away. I just think it, we're sort of in a strange time, and that there is a yearning for it. I mean, it's, I'm grateful that there's recordings and we could be able to do things like this and to be able to hear the two of you in a little clip of music, but it's still not the same as actually being able to be in a space and be able to have that. Um, and I don't know if you've heard that from musicians, how it, how it hits right here into your chest, into your heart, and sort of right to your soul. Is, um, and that's, that's what this parishioner was speaking to. So... Um, so I'm just sort of wondering how, like, how do you live into that? Like, to the, how do you live into the grief part? But also, how do you live into the hope that you know that people are yearning for um, music and wanting to, wanting to have that sort of experience? Um, well, but for now, as a musician, since we have some restriction on the stuff, we may not be able to provide a lot of music right now. But hoping like it's gonna be open again very soon but then at that time what we can do as a musician that we prepare for that moment once the things open up so meanwhile we really can focus on our practice mm -hmm. developing our musical skills or instrumental skills so we can even deliver even better performance to the people the music to the people yeah and I just want to thank you again, Mika and Dave, for joining us. And for those of you who are listening on WBNG or on the radio, we're grateful for you. Um, and we're grateful that um, you're able to visit with us today and to hear a couple more stories. Again, I'm Reverend Rachel Helgeson from Northminster Presbyterian Church in Enwell, New York. And we're so grateful for the Broome County Council of Churches for making this part of their mission and ministry to be able to speak to all sorts of different voices and hear the story that's right in front of us. Blessings to you. Thanks.